This lecture is part of an online course on commutative algebra and will be about Artinian rings and modules. So first of all, let's give the definition of an Artinian ring. Well, let's first recall the definition of notarian modules. So you remember there are three conditions that characterize notarian modules. The first is they can satisfy the ascending chain condition for submodules. Or secondly, we can have the condition that every non-empty um, set of submodules has a maximal element. And the third condition is that every submodule is finitely generated. And now um, uh, there's an obvious sort of dual set of conditions. So uh, we, we call a module Artinian if it satisfies the descending chain condition. Well, what's the descending chain condition? Well, the ascending chain condition says that if you've got any ascending chain of submodules, if these are all strictly increasing, the chain must be finite. And the descending chain condition, it's pretty obvious what you have. If you've got an inf if you've got a, um, a, a, a chain of submodules, then eventually this must stabilize and they must all be the same. Um, the dual of the second condition is obvious. It just says every non-empty set of submodules has a minimal element. And the dual of condition three, well, I don't know. Um, there doesn't seem to be a good dual of this condition. But anyway, um, you remember the equivalence of these two conditions just followed from a general property of partially ordered sets. And similarly, these two conditions are equivalent by much the same property of partially ordered sets. So that's an Artinian module. Um, so let's see some examples of them. So um, first of all, let's have some modules that are Artinian and notarian. Well, there are quite a lot of these. We can take the zero module over any ring. We can take Z modulo NZ over the integers. And more generally, any module with a finite number of elements. That, um, that obviously has to satisfy the ascending and descending chain condition for submodules, in fact, for subsets. Another example is any finite dimensional vector space over a field. Um, and we'll see a little bit later that modules that are Artinian and Notarian are sort of a natural generalization to all rings of finite dimensional vector spaces over a field. Um, um, next, we can have examples of modules that are notarian, but not Artinian. Well, that's quite easy. For instance, we can take the module Z over the ring Z. And we saw this as notarian, but it has an infinite descending chain conditions, infinite descending chain of submodules because Z contains two Z, which contains 4z, which contains 8z, and so on. So it's not Artinian because you can keep making this smaller and smaller. Um, another example is um, we can take the ring z2, which is just the set of all um, um, rational numbers a over b with b odd, and again, this is notarian, but not Artinian over itself. And we're going to see this a little bit later as the dual of something. And thirdly, 
we can have modules that are neither Artinian nor Noterian, such as Q over the integers. And here we've got an infinite chain of modules going in both directions because we can take Z contains and 2Z contain, contains 4Z and so on. And we can also extend it in the other direction, a half Z, a quarter Z and so on. So we have infinite chain, a chain of modules that's infinitely increasing and infinitely de decreasing. So it's not either of them. Finally, we get to modules that are Artinian, but not Noterian. And these modules tend to be a bit weird. For example, um, any Noterian module, um, Noterian modules tend to be more or less the same as finitely generated modules, at least over Noterian rings. So, so these modules tend not to be finitely generated. And we can see an example as we take z a half and then quotient it out by z. So this is all numbers of the form a over 2 to the n. And we can we, we, we can think of this as being isomorphic to a chain of subgroups. So we can take z over z, which is you know, z over 1z, and then this is contained in z over 2z, which we can think of as being a, um, it, well, it's not actually contained in that, but what I mean is it's naturally isomorphic to a submodule of this 4z, and we can think of that as a submodule of z over 8z and so on. And the union of these is going to be our module m that is Artinian but not Noterian. And we can see that these are the only proper submodules without much difficulty. So it's not Noterian because there's an infinite increasing chain of submodules, but it's Artinian because you can't have an infinite decreasing chain. Um, this turns up as um, it's something called the injective envelope of the module z over 2z. And it also, in some sense, it's dual, I can't spell dual, it's dual to the um, module that was um, Noterian but not Artinian we had earlier. Um, I'm not quite sure exactly what is meant by the word dual here, but if you if you look at this um, this module over z and this module over z, you can you can see it, they look very much as if they're duals to each other. Um, well, that's Artinian and Noterian modules, and let's do rings. So R is a Noterian ring, just says that R is a Noterian R module. And now it's pretty obvious what the definition of Artinian is. R is an Artinian ring. just means R is an Artinian R module. So um, it just satisfies the descending chain condition for ideals. And in order to get some idea of what these look like, let's just have a look at some examples of Artinian and Noterian rings. So the ring Z is, uh, is Noterian, but not Artinian. And this follows just as we did for modules, um, because the, it's, it's got an infinite descending chain of submodules. If we want a ring that's neither Noterian nor Artinian, um, well, for modules we used Q, but that's no good because Q as a, as, a, as a ring is in fact Noterian and Artinian because it's a field. But if we take something like Z, well, this is not Artinian, but it's Noterian, but we can make it non-Noterian just by adding in polynomials in an infinite number of variables. So this is not Noterian or Artinian. Informally, being Noterian and Artinian are conditions saying a ring isn't too big in some strange sense of the word big. So we, if, if we add lots and lots of variables, we, we tend to stop a ring from being Noterian because this, this, this ring is getting too big. Um, um, Artinian and Noterian rings. <laughs> 
are quite common. There, there are quite a lot of examples of these. For instance, we can have um, the integers modulo nz. More generally, we can have any principal ideal domain modulo an ideal that's not equal to zero. Um, for instance, we can take the ring of polynomials in a field over um, any modulo any polynomial. Um, there are lots of um, non-commutative examples, which are quite important. We won't be covering them in this course, but I'll just briefly list a few. For instance, we can take matrix rings, n by n matrices over a field, or we can take group rings of finite groups over a field. So we take k of g. And the reason these are both Artinian is that more generally, um, any algebra, any algebra over a field that is a finite dimensional vector space over, over K is Artinian and Notarian because any, any ideals must in particular be vector spaces over K. And if, if you've got a finite dimensional vector space, you can't have infinite increasing or decreasing sequences. Um, um, there are lots of, plenty of commutative examples because we can take, say, a ring of polynomials in two variables and quotient it out by an ideal of finite co-dimension. And if you remember, in an earlier lecture, we showed that there are enormous numbers of ideals of finite co-dimension of the ring of polynomials and two variables. So there are enormous numbers of commutative Artinian rings. I mean, that, that, that there are too many to classify. Finally, we should give an example of a ring that is Artinian but not Notarian to round off the four possibilities. And I'm not going to do that. And this is not because I'm being obstinate, because there actually aren't any examples of such rings. It turns out that all Artinian rings are Notarian, which is, it's actually pretty surprising, at least to me, because Artinian and Notarian seem like dual properties, but they, for rings, they're not really dual, because one of them actually implies the other. Um, this actually wasn't known in the early days of when people were studying Artinian rings. So here is... Um, it's actually Artin's book on Artinian rings. He didn't call them Artinian rings. He called them rings with minimum condition. They were only named after him later. And you see, he sort of says here, um, it was formally found expedient to impose a maximum as well as a minimum condition on ideals. That means... They, the maximum condition says that the ring is notarian and the minimum condition says it's Artinian. So he says that formerly people would talk about rings that were Artinian and notarian. And it was only later discovered that um, the Artinian condition actually implies the notarian condition. Um, so, um, so that's Artinian rings. We're now going to... Um, so next lecture, we'll, we'll be proving that Artinian rings are automatically notarian and classifying them. But in preparation for that, we want to study the um, modules that are Artinian and notarian. So first of all, we say a module is simple if the only submodules are naught and m, and m is not equal to zero. The zero module is not usually counted as simple for the same reason that one isn't counted as a prime. Um, so for example, z over pz is a simple z module, and k is a simple k module. Um, um, so um, more generally, the simple modules over r, are just, just the modules isomorphic to R over M for M maximal. This is very easy to prove, so I'll just leave it as a 
30 second exercise. Um, and more generally, we can build modules over simple modules. So M is called module of finite length. If we can find a, a chain of submodules, naught equals M naught contained in M1 and so on up to Mn equals M. So Mi over Mi minus one is simple. In other words, M is built out of a finite number of simple modules. And the length of this chain N is called the length of M. Well, you, 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 you may uh, be a little bit worried about that because there can be several different chains of submodules of M, and it's not immediately clear that they all have the same length. Um, and that's something we're going to be prove. That's something we're going to be proving fairly shortly. Anyway, let's just give some examples of modules of finite length. So, for example, a finite dimensional vector space is obviously finite length. And we'll, we should think of the finite length modules as being sort of analogs of finite dimensional vector spaces. They're, 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 they're about the same size in some rather vague sense of the word size. A second example is just the group Z over P to the N Z. So, you know, you can build up a chain of submodules, um, naught containing z over pz, containing z over p squared z. Well, it's not really contained. And what I mean is there's an isomorphism from this to a submodule of that, but whatever. Um, and so on up to z over p to the n z. And the quotients are all z modulo p z. Um, so you notice this is not a direct sum of simple modules. The simple modules are sort of joined together in a, in a somewhat more complicated way. Um, so uh, what we want, what we'll now show is that M has finite length is equivalent to M being notarian and Artinian. So in one direction, so if you want to prove that um, uh, finite length implies no turn and Artinian, we first of all notice that simple obviously implies no Tyrian and Artinian. And next we notice that if we have an exact sequence, naught goes to A goes to B, goes to C, goes to naught. So if this is exact, then A and C notarian implies B is notarian, which we may have proved earlier. And A and C artinian implies B is artinian. And you get this just by taking the proof for notarian things and kind of turning it upside down. Anyway, these are... But the, 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 these statements are both very, very easy, so I'm not going to bother proving them. So we see from this that if A and C have finite length, um, then by then B also has finite length. So A, C, finite length implies that B has finite length. Um, so, um, so anyway, so, so this implies that if M has finite length, then A and C um, are both notarian. So conversely, if um, M is notarian and artinian, let's prove it as finite length. Well, what you do is you start with the zero module of M. Then we take M1 to be a minimal non-zero. unless the module is zero, in which case we're done. And we can do that because the module is Artinian. So among the non-zero modules, we can choose a minimal one. If M1 isn't equal to M, then we choose a minimal module that's strictly bigger than M1. And again, we can do this because the ring is Artinian. So we keep going like this. And now we've got a chain of strictly increasing modules and this must actually stop. So this stops 
as M is notarian. So a module has finite length if and only if it's both notarian and artinian. Um, so uh, the last theorem we're going to have um, just says that if M has finite length, any two chains, let's say any two maximal chains, have the same length. So that's chains you can't increase by uh, squeezing in an extra module by two of the modules. So if you've got two chains, naught equals M naught contained in M1 contained in M, and the second chain, naught uh, contained in N1, and so on up to N, then we form a sort of square grid like this. And we put modules in all entries of this grid. And the modules we're going to put in here are going to be um, things of the form. Um, all, all these modules will be things like MI intersection MJ, NJ. So the ith jth position will be the intersection of these two modules. So we've got a sort of rectangular array of inclusions of modules. And now let's look at each square. So in each square, we've got four modules here. And we can look at what the quotients are. Well, the quotient of this module by this module must either be zero or it's the quotient of the corresponding module n's, as you can see. So, so this quotient is either simple or zero, and this is either simple or zero, and this is either simple or zero, and this is either simple or zero. And what you can see is the only possibilities are that either um, this quotient here is equal to that quotient there, and this quotient here is equal to that quotient there, or um, these two modules are the same and these two modules are the same, so the quotients are the same, and we've got two quotients that are the same there. So, so in each square, we either have these two quotients are the same and these two quotients are the same, or these two quotients are the same and these two quotients are the same. And now, um, this immediately implies that any two um, chains have the same length and in particular must have the same quotients in them because um, you remember one chain um, we sort of get by going along here and taking successive quotients and each of the quotients is either going to be zero or one of the simple modules in this chain. And the other quotient was got by going along this route here. So you can think of this as being a sort of taxi cab wandering around on a square grid. And now we can turn this taxi cab route into the other one by, by changing it one square at a time. For instance, we can change to this route here, and then we can change to say um, this route here. And then we might change to say, this route here, and each time you're changing the modules in your chain just by switching from one side of a square to the other side of a square. And if you look at the only possibilities for the square, this may change the order of the simple modules, but it doesn't change which simple modules you have or how many of each sort of simple module. So, so for any two chains, with simple quotients, the number of times any given simple module occurs is, is the same. Um, so um, uh, let's just write down the obvious consequences of it. So first of all, the length 
of a simple module of a finite length module. is well defined. Um, and secondly, the length is additive on exact sequences. In other words, if we've got the sequence naught goes to A, goes to B, goes to C, goes to naught, and A, B, C are finite length, then the length of A plus the length of C is equal to the length of B. And that follows because if you've got a, 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 a sort of series of submodules of A with simple quotients and a series of submodules of C with simple quotients, you can just splice those sequences together and get a series of submodules of B. Notice that the length is sort of analogous to the dimension of a vector space. In fact, it is exactly the same as the dimension of a vector space for modules over um, for modules over vector spaces. Um, th this theorem is is very similar to the Jordan Holder theorem in finite groups, which says that if you split up a finite group into simple finite groups, then the number of times each finite group finite simple group occurs is independent of how you split them up. Um, in fact, they're both special cases of a more general theorem about groups with operators on them, where you can think of a module over a ring as being a, 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 an abelian group with, with the elements of the ring acting on it as operators. Okay, so next lecture, we will be studying the structure of Artinian rings and showing that they're all notarian and showing that they're products of local Artinian rings.